The next condition that we'll be discussing is peritonitis. Peritonitis is defined as the inflammation of the peritoneum. The peritoneum is a serous membrane lining of the abdominal cavity covering the viscera or the internal abdominal organs. Peritonitis is usually caused by infection from a bacteria or fungi, but most cases result from a bacterial infection. An injury or trauma, an extra peritoneal inflammation, post-surgical procedure, and peritoneal dialysis are some of the causes for peritonitis. If left untreated, peritonitis can rapidly spread into the blood and to other organs which may cause septicemia or blood infection resulting in multiple organ failure and even death. Clinical manifestations for peritonitis would depend on the location and extent of inflammation. Pain is very evident for clients diagnosed with peritonitis. Their abdomen is also extremely tender and distended and their abdominal muscles become rigid. Other manifestations would include the following, rebound tenderness over the abdomen as well as having a paralytic ileus, diminished perception of pain may be due to the ongoing inflammatory process, anorexia, nausea, and vomiting are also experienced, peristaltic movement is also diminished for these clients, Clients also experience fever with a temperature ranging from 37.8 to 38.3 degrees Celsius. They are also tachycardic and are hypotensive if peritonitis progresses. Diagnostic exams. A complete blood count will show an elevated white blood cells which would support to an ongoing inflammation and infection. Serum electrolyte studies will result to an altered levels of potassium, sodium, and chloride. Peritonitis reduces these electrolyte levels due to the inflammatory process. Radiographic exams such as X-ray, ultrasound, CT scan, and MRI are done to detect presence of air, fluids, and abscess formation within the peritoneal cavity. Lastly, a peritoneal aspiration with culture and sensitivity exam is done to the aspirated fluid to identify the type of infection as well as the causative organism for medical management. Medical management. IVF administration and other electrolyte management are done to prevent hypovolemia or low blood volume. Analgesics are also given for pain management. Antiemetics for nausea and vomiting. Intestinal intubation and suctioning may be done to relieve abdominal pressure caused by the inflammation. Oxygen therapy to promote proper ventilation and blood circulation as well as intubation if indicated. And lastly, antibiotic therapy to fight off the infection. Paralytic ileus. Paralytic ileus is described as an occurrence of intestinal blockage in the absence of an actual physical obstruction. This type of blockage is caused by a malfunction in the nerves and muscles of the intestine. As the name itself, a paralyzed intestine, particularly its ileum. Clinical manifestations for paralytic ileus would include the following. Abdominal cramps, loss of appetite, feeling of fullness, constipation, inability to pass flatus, gastritis, nausea, and vomiting with a stool-like consistency. Diagnostic exams. Radiographic exams such as abdominal x-ray, CT scan with the use of a conscious medium and also an abdominal ultrasound are very vital in the detection of trapped gas 
within the area of obstruction and also to visualize the functioning status of the ileum. For the medical management, nasogastric suctioning may be done to relieve the pressure. IVF administration is also advised for these clients to promote electrolyte balance. And lastly, same as what we have discussed earlier for peritonitis, the paralytic ileus may also be a sign of an underlying condition. Nursing management for paralytic ileus mainly focuses on a symptomatic approach such as pain management, assessment of the client's intake and output, measuring their abdominal girths to check for any distension, and lastly, monitoring of the nasogastric decompression through its output. Next condition, we'll be tackling about the congenital aganglionic megacolon. This condition is also known as the Hirschsprung disease. It is a congenital anomaly that results in mechanical obstruction from inadequate motility of a part of the intestine. This is also described as a birth defect in which some nerve cells are missing in the large intestine, so a child's intestine can't move stool and becomes blocked. The most common cause of this condition is due to the absence of ganglionic cells in the myenteric plexus of Erba and submucosal plexus of Meissner. These ganglionic cells are responsible for regulating peristaltic waves that move digestive products towards the anal opening. Here are the common signs and symptoms for the newborns. First would be abdominal distension. Newborns also experience vomiting and constipation. They are also unable to pass meconium within the first 48 hours of life and signs of acute intestinal obstruction such as absence or decreased bowel sounds. For older infants and children, same with the newborns, they also experience abdominal distension and can only be relieved by rectal stimulation or enema. Chronic constipation, vomiting, and delayed meconium passing are also evident for these individuals. Please take note of the passage of a ribbon-like foul-smelling stools as these would highly suggest congenital aganglionic megacolon. Diagnostic exams First, we have barium enema. Same with the other conditions we have discussed earlier, a barium enema is highly preferred for newborns and infants. This procedure shows the transition zone between the dilated proximal colon and the agganglionic distal segment. Through this, the physician would be able to identify the specific site not having the adequate movement or peristalsis. Next would be erectal biopsy. This exam is considered to be the confirmatory test for Hirschsprung disease. This is to examine for histologic evidence of the absence of the vital ganglionic cells from the Erba and Meissner plexuses. We have two stages for the surgical management of congenital ganglionic megacolon. First would be the performance of a temporary ostomy. This procedure is done to create a hole proximal to the ganglionic segment to relieve obstruction and to promote normalcy in terms of the flow and its size. Second would be the suave procedure. This procedure is done by resecting the mucosa and submucosa of the rectum and the ganglionic bowel is pulled through the agganglionic muscular cuff of the rectum. The goal of this procedure is to remove the deceased or the agganglionic section of the child's intestine and then pull the healthy portion of the organ down to the anus. Take note, the suave procedure is only performed if the infant weighs 
9 kilograms and above. Imperforate anus. This is a congenital defect in which the opening to the anus is missing or blocked. In simpler terms, a closed anus. The exact cause of imperforate anus is not yet fully understood, but it is believed to be due to the abnormal development of the rectum when the embryo is forming inside the womb. Clinical Manifestations Because of the absence of the anal opening, there won't be a passage of stool within 24 to 48 hours after birth. A presence of an anal membrane would also be evident due to the pressure over the site. Of course, no opening would be observed. And lastly, fluids would be diverted to other parts of the body. Diagnostic exams. Radiographic procedures such as an abdominal x-ray and ultrasound to visualize the anatomical feature of the anus. A simple assessment through checking the newborn's temperature through the rectal route can already diagnose an imperforate anus. For the surgical management, first, an anoplastic procedure may be done to create an actual anal opening and by putting the rectal pouch into the anus. This procedure is highly performed at an earlier stage. Another possible procedure would be a temporary colostomy. Colostomy is done by creating an opening in the large intestine. Its purpose is to create another route for passage of stools and other digestive products outside the body. Closure of this colostomy is usually done within the age of 6 months to 1 year old. Nursing management for an imperforate anus. Monitoring for signs of inflammation and infection. Please do not forget its cardinal signs and symptoms. We need to instruct the parents or the significant others to position the client in a side lying or prone to relieve pressure over the anus. We need to educate the significant others on how to assess the temperature using the other routes. Toilet training is also vital with the help of a colostomy bag if indicated. And lastly, the use of Karaya gum powder for infection control. And for our last condition, we'll be discussing about hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are swollen veins in our lower rectum. Hemorrhoids are more common in men than women. Hemorrhoids are more likely to occur in men as a result of heavy lifting or engaging in strenuous activities. Hemorrhoids can develop due to an increased pressure in the lower rectum, secondary to straining during bowel movements, sitting for long periods of time on the toilet, having chronic diarrhea and constipation, and also due to pregnancy in women. Decreased fluid intake is also one of the causes in which development of hard stools is imminent which may result to straining while defecating. Classification of hemorrhoids according to the degree of prolapse. We have four. First degree until the fourth degree. These four degrees vary in terms of their site stability, ability to be reduced, and also the extent of their prolapse. We also have types of hemorrhoids according to their location. We have the internal and external hemorrhoids. Internal hemorrhoids are located above the internal sphincter, while the external hemorrhoids appear outside the external sphincter. Internal hemorrhoids are not usually painful compared to external hemorrhoids, which are very painful. Here are the common symptoms for hemorrhoids. First would be a bright red bleeding, especially when hemorrhoids rupture or burst. Prolapsing or bulging is also very evident over the affected area. 
anal pruritus or itching may be experienced, and last would be pain. To diagnose hemorrhoids, the following procedures are primarily performed to visualize and assess the presence of hemorrhoids. For an internal type, we have the DRE or the digital rectal exam, anascopy, and sigmoidoscopy. For external, still the DRE plus through a simple visual inspection. For medical management, application of cold packs over the affected area is advised to relieve pressure and also to manage pain. Topical anesthetics such as lidocaine may be used for severe pain and pruritic management. Non-surgical management for hemorrhoids. We have the infrared photocoagulation, bipolar diathermy, and laser therapy. These three procedures are done to affix the mucosa to the underlying muscle. By doing this, it would relieve the pressure and the prolapse would begin to constrict. Another procedure is sclerotherapy. It is indicated for bleeding hemorrhoids. It is done by injecting a sclerosing agent to promote blood vessel thrombosis or clotting. Surgical management First would be the rubber band ligation procedure. This is done by using a rubber band slipping into the hemorrhoids which would eventually cause necrosis or cell death. After this, the necrotic tissues and cells would be removed. Second would be the cryosurgical hemorrhoidectomy. This is done by freezing the hemorrhoids for a sufficient amount of time to cause necrosis and eventually be removed. Both procedures promote necrosis for the hemorrhoids to be removed. Third would be a stapled hemorrhoidopexy. This is considered a newer procedure. It uses surgical staples to treat prolapsing hemorrhoids. This procedure does not remove the hemorrhoids but instead controlling its growth or the extent of prolapse. And lastly, a hemorrhoidectomy, a surgery to remove the entire hemorrhoids from the body. And for the nursing management, it focuses on the relieving of pressure on the affected site both pre- and post-operatively. First, avoid the intake of irritating laxatives. Second, avoid spicy foods, nuts, coffee, and alcohol. Third, avoid sitting for long periods of time. Next, analgesics are also given for pain management. We also need to increase fiber in our diet and also practice regular bowel elimination. And lastly, we need to increase our fluid intake and we need to maintain a healthy weight. This is the end of our lecture discussion about the different alterations in GI elimination. I hope that I have shared to you vital and necessary information in taking care of our clients with GI problems. I also hope that you have learned something out from our lecture that would eventually help as you prepare to take on the responsibilities and obligations of a competent and compassionate nurse. I would like to thank you for your time and interest for this Module 3 app. You may now proceed to the next subunits. Once again, this is Mr. Benedict Y.J. Lipitan. Thank you and God bless. I'll see you on our virtual meeting.